Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal. And I'm here today with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. How are you hey, doing? Dave. Hey, David. How are you today? Good. Skype is asking me if we want subtitles on this. I oh, guess yeah? I could, we could put subtitles for our maybe people in Sweden. Because <laughs> we're getting lots of, we're doing a lot of reporting on uh, our, Bruce, our commitment and our uh, our game plan for the call to hockey is to watch the Edmonton Oilers players and prospects in Europe this season until the NHL season starts, at least, and maybe drop in on some of them as that other season continues on. And we have a list of today uh, nine players that we've watched the recent games of, and we haven't watched the most recent uh, European game uh, of Dominic Cahoon, who had a big game yesterday in his first game from Munich. Um, I'll be watching that later today and reporting on that tonight in our game grades. So, so what we're doing is watching them and giving game grades. Uh, and to, so today we're going to go over the following players. Raphael Lavoie, Evan Bouchard, Theodore Lenstrom, Philip Broberry. And we'll be, I, I guess I'm going to call him Broberry till he comes to North America. When he plays in North America, maybe I'll go back to calling him Broberg. He's in Sweden, and he's definitely Broberry. He definitely is. I was listening to the games when I was watching his game, and they said Broberry consistently. That's so. what they call you. Yeah, that's what they. Call. When uh, in Sweden do as the Swedes do. That's right. Joachim Nigard, <laughs> Yesipulia Yarvi is on our list. William Lagason, Lagason as they call him. Ryan McLeod is in Switzerland, and Dmitry Samarukov is in the KHL playing for Seska. So we will uh, go over those players. So some of them you've only seen, some of them I've only seen, some of them we've both seen. And we'll just give our just our general impressions. I do want to make one comment, Bruce, to start this whole thing off. In I don't know if this is the, the plan of Ken Holland, or like the secret master plan to, to, to bring depth players at a cheap price to the Edmonton Oilers. But I'm seeing some signings that are very similar in, in terms of the type of player that they brought over. And so so if they if I was to enumerate the quality or the, uh, describe the qualities of these players, they're all fast. They're all really good skaters. They're all really smart hockey players, high hockey IQ. And they're hardworking players. They, they get in there, even if they're not, and they're, they're not big. None of them are big, actually, these three players. He seems to be looking for this kind of player and signing them to bring veteran, and they're veterans. They're all veterans. Right. They're all like 26, 27. So last year he brought in two of them, Gaetan Haas and Joachim Nygaard. And this year they have found another player who I find, ex like I'm telling you, I find this player really exciting, and I think he's an NHL player. He's at least the third-pairing defenseman if there's a spot for him. He can, he can do well in this role, and this is Theodor Lenstrom of Forlunda. And we're going to talk about him. So I don't know if this is Holland's plan, but if it if it is a plan, it's a very really good plan. Like if you've got a plan and you're looking for on this Oilers team, you've already got the superstars. You don't need the you're not looking for that, but you need right. these veterans who can fill in. If this is the plan and this kind of player in today's NHL, where you don't need to necessarily find a lot of you know big power players like the big guys, I think this is an excellent plan. Say you, Bruce. Organizational depth, it's a thing. I mean, you have to you have to build it with the young kids through the draft. But if all your organizational depth is age 22 and 21 and below, then, you know, you're not ready for the here and now. You want to have some guys that are in the 25, 26, 27-year-old wheelhouse. And Ken Holland has consistently gone after guys in that age group, 26, 27 in particular. Last summer, he signed a bunch of them. And uh, he Your show uh, and yeah, uh, yeah, others. yeah, yeah. Well, Archibald, Shane, uh, some of the guys were NHLers. Uh, Grandin was an NHLer, but also the two uh, Europeans that you already mentioned. They were all either 26 or 27, one year contract. And uh, this uh, Theodore Lindstrom, you and I just watched his most recent game. And uh, I came away very favorably impressed by his ability. Uh, he can really skate. Uh, and not only can he skate, he does skate. His legs are always moving. He's, he's doing these crossovers and he's changing directions and he's seeing the open ice and he's, he's feeding himself into it when he doesn't have the puck. Or 
he sees the open ice and he feeds a puck into it where a teammate can get it. He, he, his puck distribution skills impressed me. You know, he made three or four passes in that game that were maybe five to ten feet, and they were just perfectly executed. Uh, you know, just chip the puck into the right area where it's good for your team and it's going north from there. And uh, he uh, he covered that uh, covered that off uh, nicely. And uh, he was an offensive threat to score himself. He came close to scoring while well, he scored uh, one goal on a one-time blast. And he nearly overpowered the goalie with a with a wrist shot that that the goalie got a blocker on that just popped up and over the net. That one nearly went in. A play where he just switched off and he went he he. he backpedaled off the point and he flipped in behind the puck carrier and then the guy dropped the puck over and he had an open shot and wham but that was all you know it was a planned play but uh the reason you can plan plays like that is you have to have guys that are super mobile to uh to do those kind of uh, maneuvers and uh mobility is a major strength for this player he's not a perfect player obviously right he, he's okay. not big He's, he's, a, they list him at about six one. I don't know if he's six, six. It looks, he looks about five eleven to me. And, and he's, he's, he's slender. He's a smaller player. And, and there's, there was moments in this game too, where there was one where he lost a, a battle off a face off and it led to a mm-hmm. good chance against yep. And I've seen him have a little bit of trouble against bigger forwards. So defensively, he, he's in the right position defensively and he will, uh, he's game defensively. But his reach isn't <clears throat> reach isn't outstanding. He's a smaller guy, and um, he's going to get beat now and then just by sheer power and by just bigger players having bigger reach. Um, that said, defensively, uh, as I said, he's game and he he's in the right position. And the good thing is, when he does win the puck, he, here's he's what gone. I really love. Here's what I love about him. He just he's he's the man of a million feints. And, and mm-hmm. he's a very tricky hockey player. He's constantly faking shots and faking passes and moving his stick and misdirecting other players to get them to go to the wrong way and then making the pass. And the player that came immediately to mind when I first saw him, and I mentioned this last, last, last was Lars Eric Schubert, Schubert, mm-hmm. as they would call him. What do you think, Bruce? Well, yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's, high praise. that's, that's high praise indeed. Uh, what I was thinking last podcast, we were talking about the hotline in Winnipeg, and I was talking about all the crisscrossing and stuff. And of course, Lars Eric Shoeberry was a big part of that. Yes, he where was. Where he'd be the late guy that'd show up out of nowhere, and all of a sudden he'd be all alone with the puck, you know, and and <laughs> or he'd be the guy that was sort of making the first outlet pass that that set up the you know rush. And I see both those things in what I saw out of Leinster. Mind you, this is one game, but you reported very similar in the previous game of his that you'd watch, and I'm going to go back and watch a couple more of myself now because I'm intrigued. And you're right about the feigning. Like, he's constantly sort of pivoting, and he's so so uh, agile on those crossovers, and he's sort of changing his shooting, his passing angles uh, as he goes. And you talk about, I mean, there was on the goal that he scored, uh, this was it was quite a sequence of plays. First of all, it was a power play, and they teed him up for a shot in the one timer in the slot, and he wound up in an opposing player basically sold out. He was going to block that shot. He, he he sold out to get in the lane, and Lindstrom had the full wind up, and he pulled it down, and he pulled the puck away from the guy, and he just kept the cycle going. Then the, in the middle there was a play where they were going to clear the puck, the other guys. And Lindstrom came charging up into the middle of the ice and got his skates in the way of the clearing pass, and it bounced off his skates and stayed in the zone, and it cycled around again. The third time, they teed him up in the high slot. Boom, one timer, rippled the net. It was a, it was a rocket. So there was a lot to like in that sequence. Skill and smarts and mobility. I mean, what do you want? Back end. I mean, other things in addition to those skills, but you sure want all of those things. He can fill in on the power play. Uh, for the Edmonton Oilers, like he could run their power play. I just, you know, mm-hmm. now maybe this is a case. This is a lower level of competition in the NHL, decidedly, mm-hmm. and this is a case where oh, this is a player like it's the you know the AHL superstar, the guy who can score, who, who shines at the. But listen, I don't see that in this player because because the 
the skating is there. The NHL skating is there. And the NHL thinking of the game plus, is there. Plus skating at the NHL level. Yeah. So, so I'm not that worried about that. Like, whoever the frick signed this player for the Oilers, give that man a raise. Like, <laughs> I don't know who, who recommended this guy to Ken Holland or where they, you know, you know, not a player I'd ever heard of until the moment they'd signed him. Yeah, yeah. He's not drafted. Before. You know, and then... and. I think he's he's a late bloomer is what he is because you know his his scoring numbers suddenly picked up last year. He was about a point every third or fourth game early in his career and then last year he was a point every second game closer to that. So he's a player who has who has developed uh um, it looks like um and uh is is coming on. You know the, the the power play one that I remember the most he was there was quite a few power plays this game that he was on. Uh, the, the goal was nice, but there was another one where he got the puck back at the point and he, and he faked the slap shot. And then there was a player right on him. So he did a 360 spinorama to get around him all of a sudden and was in. What His calm with the puck is impressive. And, you know, there's other Oilers defenseman prospect for watching right now. Broberry, uh, big slow-moving Nima line and there's Samarukov who's a, who's a pretty who's playing some pretty good hockey there's um Bouchard yep. um in the Elsvenskan at the lower level there's Lagesson at the lower level there's mm-hmm. Maryland uh, um in the Swedish elite league as well but I, I see in terms of a player who can help the Oilers next year from what I'm seeing so far it comes down to two guys in, in this group of players it's Evan Bouchard and it's Theodore Lindstrom with Lagesson also in, in the running. And it's not, and this is a segue to Philip Broberry. It is not Philip Broberry. And um, oh, I have been, time. I've been really super impressed with Broberry's skill level. Um, and he's had some, he's had some up and he's, you know, been inconsistent even within games, but he, his skill level is fantastic. Bruce, he, he, he does so much right. To me, he is so in the right place right now. He is on the right team to, to keep learning, keep developing his game, because there's also inconsistency, there's mistakes uh, that's going on. He's, but he's getting, for all that, he's getting top four minutes um, on the Sheleftia team. Keep him there. I don't even, like, I, I know they're probably going to bring him over to training camp. That's, that's going to happen. But to me, that's fine. But to me, he he's in the right place right now for this season, uh, playing with Sheleftia. If there's no AHL, uh, especially like you know, would you keep him around the taxi squad with the Oilers? So unless something changes between now and them, and he's a young player, he could quickly advance. But I I really like him where he's at. I think he, there's lots of really great moments and games with him, but I don't see him really unleashing his full game yet in Sweden. The way right. that guy can skate and carry the puck, I want to see him start doing that in Sweden. Like, develop your offensive game there. I think you're, they're going to give him the green light, and he's close to being a, like that breakout player where he's where he's scoring points more regularly and uh, just going through the whole team almost or or often. Um, but he's not quite there yet. The confidence isn't there. The reads of the game aren't there, and so that's what I see with him is. Uh, I'm super happy with the pick. I've seen some great games, but I've seen inconsistent moments. What did you see in, in the game that you just saw? Yeah, well, I saw his most recent game, and uh, of the five guys that I, I watched, uh, I was least impressed, frankly, with his game. I, I graded him, you know, get, given the, uh, you know, our, our gradings or our normal processes are compromised, to say the least, and not the level of competition changes in, in, in between leagues. We see that player shifts within the game as opposed to the context of the whole game. You're concentrating on the one guy, though. That's yeah. a good thing. You're really focused on what the one guy is doing. And I didn't think he had that. Like, he skated himself out of trouble a few times, but I didn't think he had his grade A wheels going. Like, that guy can really fly. And in this game, you know, he was sort of very good as opposed to outstanding on the skating department. Yeah. And he was less proactive. And he, you know, he was, uh, they won four to two, Shalefti, to break a five game losing streak. And he was on the ice for the two goals against, and he was, he just came on on a line change for one of the goals four. So, you know, his, his part of the game was not great for Shalefti. And he was, uh, 
sort of not the major culprit, but he didn't really get the job done defensively on either of those two goals for starters. But uh, uh, he's just he seems to be in a flat space. That's six games with the five losses in this win. Zero points, minus six. You know, and he's been a minus in every game but one in there. And, and you know, we all know the flaws of plus minus, but usually when a guy runs into a string of minuses, hello, Leon Dreisaitl, the guy's in a slump. You know, and, and slump. That's, that's basically what, what I saw last night was a player that was, you know, showed the skills in flashes, but uh, had, didn't really put it all together in that game. So uh, we've seen him, I think, in three. I saw him in two games, and you've seen him in the one. And I think he's gone down each game a little bit. I think he might might be a little banged up. I wouldn't. Um, I wondered that myself. And but players go in defensive slumps mm -hmm. um, often because they're a little nicked up. But this happens. And um, last game that I saw, the the winning goal against he was out for, and the um, he was covering a guy in front of the net of Shalefti's net. And uh, the point men broke in and beat uh, the Schlefti a winger. So that's not Broberg's fault, that he's now right. suddenly a two-on-one. Mm -hmm. But he kind of stayed with his man a bit too much rather than going out to meet the new threat. Like, it was a tough play. But maybe I was hoping for a, just a little bit more um, something. I could just stop the play. Like, make the play. Stop it from stop the goal. Because the guy was charging right in on that, and he deked the goalie, and he scored. So it's it's not... Really, his fault, but it, he's out there, and he could have done something, and maybe someone else, maybe he, maybe on a better day, or maybe another player would have. So that's the kind of mistake that that was, and and I, and he just seemed a little bit caught in the headlights in that moment, not really knowing what to do. How do you respond to the emergency, and how do you can you put out the fire? Is uh, you know, that's what happened in the uh, first goal against last night. Like his team was rushing up the ice, and his partner i think it was on the on the left wing boards anyway made a terrible pass across the middle of the ice right to the other team and he was kind of caught in no man's land and the, and the forward on the other team burst behind him and he tried to stand up and kind of front the pass well he couldn't pick off the pass and the guy just pulled away on a breakaway and scored and i just thought this reaction was you know, maybe just not quite instinctive enough, and that's a little bit worrisome. Like, it's that kind of uh, response to emergency. It, it, it comes naturally to some players, and it doesn't to others. And on this particular play, at least, I'm not saying this player, it doesn't happen, but it didn't happen on this play. That uh, he, he uh, you know, he, he, he didn't attack the puck, and he didn't take the danger man, you know, either one. So he well, kind of cut the middle. Yeah, it's his, it's, it's, it's second, league, second year in this league. And as Al McGuire, so. and as Al McGuire, the great uh, basketball analyst, uh, one of my favorite sports announcers of all time, said, "The best thing about he, he was talking about uh, college basketball players, and he said the best thing about freshmen and sophomores is they become juniors and seniors." <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, this is what we're saying. This is what I'm saying. Though, like, slow cook this guy. Like, you, there's lots of hype, and we've I've added to it. Like, I, I'm really excited about this hockey player. Everyone was excited about the talent they saw um, when he came to the camp in July. This is an immensely talented hockey player, and he's going to be a very good NHL hockey player, I believe. But don't rush him. Take your time. He is in a very good spot right now. He's on the right team and the right place to develop in Sheleftia. And I, my preference, just leave him there all year long. I don't, you know, bring him over to training camp, sure, but let's let's not rush this guy at all. Um you got Landstrom. If you need help this year, yeah. like honestly, you've got a player who's, in terms of his hockey, his hockey sense right now, his hockey IQ, he's just at a different level. He's six years older, yeah. seven years older than Broberry. So, and he's what? he's a dominant thinker of the game right now in the Swedish league. I don't know if there's a defenseman. There, there's probably some defenseman who think the game better than Landstrom in the Swedish league, but it's a very small list. I can guarantee you that. And um, he's just what the Oilers need right now. Like to, you know, they have a player here who's who's ready. He's twenty six year old and ready. So good at keeping the puck in at the blue line too. That's a way to win my heart. I love players that can do that. I he... used to love Charlie Huddy for that. Just he was so good at it. Anyway, that's so. Uh, um, he did it a couple times, didn't yeah, he? Oh, like, yeah. Oh times. yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it's. Uh, uh, I look at Broberry and, and I mean. 
obviously this is kind of a biased comparable, but I, I do compare him to Oscar Kleffbaum, who was uh, drafted in the first round by the Oilers in 2011, a little lower in the first round. But he, he had the same kind of general profile, tremendous athleticism and still kind of grown into himself and into how to play that position. They left him in Sweden for two years. They brought him over and they stuck him in the AHL for most of the first year and part of the second year, and then he was ready. And that's kind of a, a uh, you know, it's kind of a, a template for all that the Oilers have have a, a sorry track record of rushing their forwards. They've actually done not too badly in terms of developing the defensemen over the years, at least in terms of the time frame. And of course, Oscar being Oscar, he got injured and missed most of that second year in Sweden anyway, so it didn't matter. But, you know, I think that the plan was the right plan. And and it, it's just as right a plan for Brobury as it was for Kleppbaum. That's a pretty good comparison in terms of like their hockey sense and hockey skills. Like he's very similar to Clefbaum in a lot of ways in terms of, of that, which is which is good, but not at the highest level. But the, the difference between Broberry and Clefbaum is Broberry's a, a, a superior skater. So um, that's 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 the the one um, amendment I would make to that comp. All right, you got the cat. What's your cat's name again? Cat Stevens. <laughs> She had that name when we adopted her, so we didn't change it. Even All right. It. <laughs> Good name. Good name. for. I'm just trying to think of a Cat Stevens lyric. My mom was a huge Cat moon Stevens. Moonshadow. I'm being followed by a moonshadow. Moon I sing it to her because she does follow me around. <laughs> um, let's move on to the next most likely defenseman in Europe, I think, who's, like, who's going to help the orders this coming year, and that's Evan Bouchard. Mm -hmm. And... Now he's playing at a lower level of competition. Yes, but he's come on. He's eating it alive. Is is what I saw in the game that I saw, and I hadn't seen him play since January, I think. And um, mm -hmm. he's like a robot, Bruce, in terms of his passing. I, I, I'm not. It's like it's like he's got a laser on his stick, which is laser guided to the tape of the <laughs> other guy's stick, and it just effortlessly, immediately, amazingly beautifully goes from Bouchard's stick to the other guys, his click. teammates stick. Click, 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 click. Yeah. Wow. And his, um, his, um, you know, this, the game that I saw was the one where most older fans have seen the highlighter, the, you know, the ones on Twitter, at least where he gets the puck at his own, um, on the, on the, uh, right side, uh, and then circles, circumnavigates the rink. That's the behind the net. <laughs> it's the full Hamsky, then cuts into the middle and whips in the shot. It was just one of many very, very good plays, though, he made in the game that I saw. I mean, he was really, I gave him an eight. He was a great, he had a great game. He had three points. Um, he, People he, rightly pointed out the uh, the weak defense and the terrible switch off that was made between the forward and the yeah. D on the other team. But to Bouchard's credit, you can say, he took advantage of that. When the hole was there, he that's when he stepped up his pace from gliding around to bursting into the hole and then made the shot. So credit were due. Yeah, he, he uh, he's jumping up into the play a bit faster. Like if there's any new thing that I'm seeing a little bit, he's a quick bit uh, faster jumping up into the play and joining in the play like like Lenstrom. Like. like that's what Lenstrom's constantly doing is jumping up into the play, joining the attack. Bouchard did that in this in the game that I saw. He's really getting in there and... Now, now again, this is against the lower level of competition, so that that has to be factored into everything. But he just right. he just was really his passing was out of this world good in that game that I saw. What did you see? Oh well, I saw him miss a couple of passes in the neutral zone that came back for icings, and I saw the you know his reaction was of a player who expects to make that pass every time. The first time he slapped his stick on the ice. And the second time he banged his stick on the ice, and then he didn't do it again after that. He didn't miss any more passes. <laughs> yeah, but his his uh, his passing is. I like the weighting of his passes. I like the timing of his passes, and I, you yeah. know, on the delivery, like he's got that. Uh, he knows when to fire it, and he knows when to take a little bit off of it. And, and you know, he's he, he's. Uh, I would call him a gifted passer. Like he, it's you know, it's natural and and it's a big skill. And he reads. Offensively, at least, he reads the ice. And so even though he's not a great skater, he knows where the good ice is and he heads toward it. And when he rushes the, the puck up the ice, it doesn't look like there's much room and like he's not pulling away from anybody, but they're not 
taking the puck off him because he's skating into where where he's not going to get checked. So he you know he's got some he's got some really good instincts in terms of uh, his position on the ice and and you know where the pass receivers are. In my game that I watched, he got two assists and uh, one was a a shot pass that the that the guy that the guy tipped home and the other one was a a, a good pass across the slot for a, you know a great A chance and they scored on the rebound so he got a second assist on that one but uh, uh, you know both good plays he's very very good on the offensive blue line or point like that's Isn't that's he? his that's his strong strong uh, uh, point he so. does what uh, the, you know the master Brett Burns does in in that mm-hmm. moment and he's got the size to do it in that he adjusts his shot constantly he'll pull it in a little bit he'll make a quick move. Um, he'll uh, walk the line a little bit and then come back, and he, he just gets that shot through again and again and again. And it's he's got a very quick, elegant uh, motion, shooting motion, to get that puck on net. Um, yeah, he's you know I don't know what's going on with Ethan Bear's contract. Um, I, I'm assuming I'm assuming it's this that. Um, they're waiting to see what's happening with Clef Bomb. Hundred percent. Because I think it could, I think it could free up. You could go with two different ways with Bear. You could give him the the lowest minimum, and then his only, his only, his only, not the lowest minimum, but like a million dollars a year, something in, in that range, like a, a low amount for a player of his ability and and stature on the team, the amount of playing time he got last year, because he doesn't have any. The only thing he could do would be to sit out. I'm not. I don't know if oh, if it's. No. I don't. I don't know. I don't. And, I, and it would be a very bad idea with Bouchard waiting in the wings. I'll tell you, uh, very, very bad idea. But what I think is actually happening with 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 uh, Ethan Bear is they're waiting to see with Clefbaum because there's a possibility they could give him a two year or a three year deal. And the only way they can do that if there is cap space, and if right. Clefbaum really is out for sure, there will be cap space. So that then allows you to give Bear a two million dollar a year contract, like for two years or something, like give him more. Um, using that clef bump uh, space, so I think that's that's I'll wait my for guess. That. Absolutely. But if it's the other thing, and, and Bear is thinking, I'm gonna I'm gonna grind them down and sit out. I don't think it is this is it either. But the, the reason I'm bringing this up right now is don't do that, Ethan. That's a very, with Evan Bouchard there, Tyson Berry there, and and Adam Larson there. You don't want to do that, and I don't think that's what it is. But if it is, that's a bad idea. No, I to my eye, this kid hasn't made a false step yeah there and uh there yeah. and he's he's uh by, through his actions on and off the ice and just in terms of who the person that he is he's won a huge fan set in this city this is oh, yeah. where he wants to be and uh he, you know why alienate anybody i mean he may wind up in the situation that kevin lebanc was in last year in san jose when they were so tied up against the cap and LeBanc was coming off a terrific sort of platform season from his entry-level contract. He took a one-year deal for $1 million, and people were going, what? That's like a huge underpay, and it was. Uh, but he ha- he didn't have the arbitration rights. He was, sub- you know, he was vulnerable, or they were vulnerable to an offer sheet if somebody really wanted to go after the player. But the player's got to think long and hard before he signs the offer sheet, because that's that in itself. I think one of the reasons we don't see that happen very often is because it's breaking a trust with the fans and you don't need to do it. You can tell the management, look, we've got this offer sheet out here. So you're going to need to be competitive with that without actually going out and signing it. And then, you know, it it just, it changes the dynamic. And I just don't see him doing that. What happened with Kevin LeBanc is he had actually a less good season in 2019, 20, and he just signed a four year extension, $4.725 million. So he got paid. He just had to wait a year. And that's, I think that's, That's one scenario facing Ethan Bear, and the other is, as you say, if they get strong word that Clef bombs out, and they know they're, you know, they're going to have four million dollars of cap space, I can see him getting two times two point five, and then you, 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 yeah. you blocked him up for, for, you know, instead of one million for the first year and four and a half million for the second year, you're, you're actually just spreading it out a little bit, and I, I think that's either scenario is quite viable at this point, and they're just kind of waiting for some clarification from the Oscar camp. Yeah, I don't know where Bouchard is going to fit in on the orders because they have obviously Larson, Bear, and Barry. Now, 
there's injuries, right? And and people get hurt all the time. So so that's the most obvious thing. He's next up. But again, he's definitely like, there's no way in the world, Bruce, that I would have picked Matt Benning over Evan Bouchard for next year. Personally, like picking a team. Unless there's, you know, you just you, unless there's some personality thing that I'm unaware of. But Evan Bouchard is ready for the NHL. I I think he's just he's such a fine hockey player. He, his offensive game is it's uh it's pretty remarkable um, offensive uh, ability that he has. And I think the, de- the, the defense is going to be strong enough for third pairing uh, at this point. So he, he, the Oilers are, are really set at right D. And if someone gets hurt, they're still, they still have three guys. And then if someone else, you know, Lenstrom and Sam Marukov and um, Lagas, Lagasun can also all play um, th- that other side. Because Lenstrom was playing and Sam Marukov are playing the right side. Yes. Um, both of them so, did in the game. Oh, so, huh? yeah, the orders are at right defense. And Chris Russell can, of course. But I, I, I don't want to see that ever again. Um, these other players are all... You don't even notice a difference, for instance, when Lenstrom or Samarukov are playing on the, their offside. They're just so natural at it. Right. It, just, it just comes so easily. I think Caleb Jones is the same as well. Like it just some, comes so much more easily to some players than others. I, you know, um, so... The Oilers are set at right D, but Bouchard is ready, you know, so if there is an injury, the Oilers are going to be okay. Right. Well, his spot, I mean, Tyson Berry basically took his spot and blocked him for this year, but they signed him to a one-year deal. Yeah. And Bouchard's got, the, you know, well, one more year, and of course you say injuries are, are a possibility, but in the meantime, you know, there's still holes in his game. Like, I, I don't see him as a strong defensive player, and if you want to really make an impact in the NHL, you know, you need to tighten up on that. Uh, he made, in the Game I watched, he's got a, a such a low panic point, Evan Bouchard, and mostly that's a really strong thing. But there are times you're sort of going, "Hey man, it's about time to panic here." You know, guys all over you, move the damn puck. And and I mean, he's just, I mean, he's just, uh, 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 he he really is uh, uh, calm feet, as my friend Low Tide says. He has calm feet. You know, he keeps his position, he takes his time, and he makes. He makes the play, but there are times, and he, he's going to need to, and he has worked on this, step up the urgency and the pace at which the simple stuff, you know, it's it's not junior hockey anymore, and it's, you know, not going to be the AHL, it's going to be the NHL, and you're going to have that 0.2 seconds less to make that play than you're used to having, and you better, you know, you're just going to have to... Uh, to raise the tempo that tiny little bit. I think, you know, clearly he's got the smarts for it and, and, uh, and skill set with some question about the skating mobility. I, I think he's kind of where uh, Yamamoto was last year at the mm-hmm. same time in that, uh, it's, you know, it doesn't, certainly doesn't hurt him to play in a different league than the NHL, but I, I do think he's ready. And Yamamoto came close to making the NHL. Yeah. Bouchard came close two years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, he played how many games? He, he, he listen. Games. He wasn't terrible in those games. He didn't. He didn't look like you know. He didn't look like this horrible. Like why is he here? He looked like he was. He was actually okayish in those games. And that's two years ago now. He's mm-hmm. got two full years. Is it two years ago? Yeah, it's two years yeah, ago. He was went McCallan. back to London, and then he yeah. went back to Bakersfield and played yeah. the whole year in Bakersfield. So, all I'm saying, Bruce, is right side of the defense for the next five, ten years. Bouchard and, and Ethan Bear. The Oilers could do worse than that on the right side of their defense. And um, Broberry also plays on the right side, now that I think of it now and then. He's, they're, all, they're all shifting over there in Europe. It seems much more common right now in Europe to have uh, lefties on the right side. It seems just really, e- even within a game, they're shifting back and forth from left and right side. Uh, all of those players. Okay, let's move on to Raphael Lavoie, the terror the terror of all Svenskin league, Bruce. Yeah, I'll say. Uh, he's playing on an absolutely brutal team. Uh, 14th and last place team in uh, in the league. And what, what do they have? Uh, uh, they played 13 games. And they won two. And they got uh, 23 goals, four and 54 against. So they're being outscored more than two to one. Well, Raphael Lavoie is, by eye, and like I said, I didn't watch the whole game again, but I watched his shifts. But by eye, he's the best player on the team by a lot. And the way they're relying on him, they know it too. You know, like he's on the power play. He's playing huge ice time. He played 22 and a half minutes playing forward in this last game. 
and it was the second time in the, uh, in their current seven game losing streak that they lost the game five two and Lavois scored both goals. You know, I mean that's what kind of team it is, and uh, he scored early on a on a nice rush up the wing, got behind the defense and 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 uh, cut in front of the net and jammed one through the goalie. And second goal that he scored uh, is uh, he scored well. You, you, go to the post on the cult of hockey about last night's game the picture at the top of the post shows where he scored it from top of the left circle and that's where he likes to do a lot of his business he likes to play left side and in the most recent game he basically played left wing the whole game he likes to have that forehand open on the on the inside of the ice a better shooting angle and snap off those shots so he's a right shot he's a right shot and he's a big fellow. Like, he's the youngest guy on the team, and he's also basically the biggest guy or tied for the biggest guy on the team. Uh, and uh, he's, you know, and, and he's not fast, fast. Like, he doesn't look fast, but he's faster than he looks, big guy. And he keeps his feet moving. Like, some, some, of, the, some of the slower guys, some of the big problem you have is the guys that sort of stand around and wait for the puck to come from him. And you know, and they they don't have any momentum when the puck changes direction. But he does keep his his uh, his feet moving, or he has been to this point. Uh, and uh, he you know he creates some uh, open ice for himself, and he's got uh, he's got some nice skills. So he, you know he's got an excellent shot, and he likes to let fly. Is he just turned twenty? Just turned twenty? Yeah, just just twenty now. Yeah. Okay. So, so this is. We were talking about how Maximov, Kirill Maximov, is kind of still struggling over in, in uh, he struggled in his first AHL season, and he struggled, uh, he's struggling so far to get playing time at Seska. He, he's doing a little better in the VHL there, I think he's, he's, he's yep. doing pretty well. But this is a really good sign from Lavoie. This league that he's playing in the Allsvenskan is kind of between, in terms of its quality of competition, it's kind yeah. of be- between the, the major junior leagues and the Swedish elite league. It's kind of right in the middle of those. So it's a step up for him in terms of competition, mm-hmm. and he's acing it. So that's that's a good sign. It's probably not too different from the VHL, but we haven't had yeah. a chance to see the VHL. Right. But, you know, it's a, it's a Tier 2 league, so it would be somewhere below the AHL. You know, it's to the Swedish league what the AHL is to the NHL. So it's and you know, I think a step down. And, yeah. To give Maximov some credit here, I do think he's doing pretty well in the VHL games. I haven't, we haven't watched six points in five games last. So there you go. So there you go. Maybe that was an unfair comment for me to say that, you know, Maximov's not doing well this year. He's, but he is a year older than Lebois, right? Like so. So there is that. This is you'd, you'd, what you would have hoped that he would get a foothold in the KHL team, and but that's a tough league to crack the KHL, especially for young players who aren't going to be maybe, but he will be there for the full year, right? Like he signed on for the full year. I, I believe. think so. He's you a sign similar. Russia, similar in that, Kotz, yeah, stay in it. He's, he's a, stay in. Sorry, David. He's a, he's similar in that he's a kind of a big hulking right shooting left wing that likes to, likes to shoot the puck. But I would put Lavoie well ahead of Maximov at this moment in time, based on what I've seen of the two. And we'll watch Maximov's games, right? So oh, we'll, sure. Yeah. He's still a prospect. Uh, speaking of right shooting players who like to play the left side, especially on the power play, Yessa Pugliarvi, Bruce. Mm-hmm. What did you, you – so I've seen him in some games. You saw him in a game. What, did, what was your take? Oh, he, he was a big impact player on this game. Uh, flying. He was just skating right from the opening faceoff. He caused a turnover and created a power play in the first 10 seconds of the game. with uh, And just kind of swooping around out there, right? Swooping in and, in and out of places. And, and uh, uh, as your favorite basketball commentator called aircraft carrier that you mentioned in a previous <laughs> podcast. Uh, what, what's the guy's name again? Al McGuire. Al McGuire. Yes. Uh, and... Uh, he was uh, like he's clearly part of the game plan of the team. Is that anytime there's sort of a, a loose puck that's about to get turned over to his team, Yasser would take off, sort of fly the zone, cheat for offense, you might say, except for the team was in on it and they would be grabbing the puck, wheeling and looking for him in the, in the neutral zone or dumping the puck up the boards and letting him win the race to it, which he did constantly. He won a bunch of races to pucks. And then once he got the puck, with his uh, between us using his size to sort of 
block, you know, to shield the puck from other guys, and using that huge, huge wingspan, and using the, you know, the soft hands that he's got, he can control and and and, and set up plays. And, and in this particular game, he was uh, strictly doing the playmaking. He was uh, uh, he he only shot once, I think, in the whole game, but he was passing, passing, passing. And he set up one goal with a nice shot pass into the slot that was tipped home. And he had two others easily could have been primary assists for the goalie on the other team. Made two excellent saves that uh, that uh, was the only reason that Yasser didn't have multiple points. And it was a game that they they wound up winning 2-1. And they're playing very, very, I think, tight to the vest hockey. Like they... Uh, uh, Carpat out, outshot their opposition... Eucharit, not Eucharit, Eucharit, uh, two, uh, 27 to 12 in this game. That was the shots on net. Wow. And they've been playing low-scoring games, so so every every point has uh, carries a lot of value in the, you know, low-scoring games, obviously. In the games that I've seen, I think I've seen him play, well, I've seen him play a lot of games, actually, this year. I watched all the, his early games, six or seven of them, and then, then, then they had that two-week break because of COVID alert. Um, mm-hmm. He was he was just fantastic, and um, like you know this big air, he just you know he's he's the aircraft carrier dominating the Pacific Ocean, is what he is. He's <laughs> just in that in that theater. Um, yes, he pulled the He's a fantastic player, and again, like his point scoring isn't uh, great right now. It's like almost a point a game, but in the games I saw, he could have easily had two or three points each of the games, almost like some of them maybe not so much, but at least one and maybe two or three points a game. So I think that the he might have an explosion at some point of point scoring because he's going to start to have some big games where where it all comes together for him. Uh, in terms of like how he fits in in the Oilers is just really an unknown. Like, yeah, I don't think we've seen this player this yet version of Yessi Puljujarvi since he was a junior player um, in the World Junior Tournament, um, dominating. That's what he reminds me of. Like, this is the player that we're seeing again, and and I hope it's. They figure out a way to have this translate to the NHL because this is a very strong offensive powerhouse. This is a player who can really he can be a game, the difference maker in a game, and and he he's a top six forward in the NHL. I think this is you know eventually might take a little bit of time to figure it out, but I hope they put their minds to it and, and really do figure out the role for him, an attacking role. Um, yeah for him because he he's an attacker he's a dangerous attacking hockey player and a very good one well he was putting the pressure on the other team i mean they weren't one of the reasons they only had 12 shots was they didn't have the puck like the possession numbers were strongly in favor of of uh, carpat and i would think doubly so while the poliarvi was on the ice because like say they would they would dump it into his area and he would he would win the puck and then the cycle would be on and I, I got the impression that this is a good possession player. Whether how much of that's going to get turned into you know goals, points, at the NHL level versus simply you know uh, controlling the play. I mean both things are important. Obviously you want to control the play and eventually score goals. And we'll see what kind of uh, what kind of a finisher he is. But uh, he had some good ideas in this game, and I thought a couple of his passes were. Maybe could have been a little bit more creative, but I mean, he was he was very unselfish with the puck in this game, and he really distributed it. And, and uh, uh, he was, at least in the in the 16 minutes that he played, the best player on the ice. All right, uh, I saw Joachim Nigard play uh, mm-hmm. recently, and um, uh, everything's back in his game except a little bit of polish. Like he's only got one point in six games. Uh, I think that's because he's rusty. He's he's had the same hand. He broke the hand, and then he hurt it again. Needed surgery as recently as l- late September. Then he came back pretty quickly though in October, mm-hmm. and uh, he's played the six games. So he's he he's everything that you remember. He's fast. He's pesky. He's skilled. He's making some really nice passes. Uh, he's a hardworking guy. I, I really like his game. I think he, he can play in the NHL and he's routing into form. And I, the points were supposed to, the year before he came to the orders, 
he was one of the top point scorers and goal scorers in the Swedish scorer, League. Yeah. And um, when that that timing and polish is going to come back to his game, and I think we'll, he'll start to put up more points in that league and be ready for training camp here. So um, that was that was good to see because you know the same hand. Hopefully, he doesn't get injured again. Injury can be such a huge killer of players' uh, chances in pro hockey. Uh, but he's back and he's doing well. My understanding, uh, uh, it comes part of it comes from an excellent commenter on Low Tide's uh, blog, well, Swedish poster, and he's some kind of medical doctor that lives in Sweden, and he's all over the Swedish league. And he said that knee guards didn't didn't suffer a separate injury to the hand. Is that he came back from the first surgery, and he basically played the first game of the season and said it's not right. I, you know, I can't play with oh, this. And okay. they had a second surgery to fix the same problem. And the, the original prognosis was four to six weeks, and he was back in three and playing. But, you know, snipers and their hands are kind of important. And I would suggest that maybe, let's hope that it comes around, but I would suggest his hands aren't quite what they were. And, and he's he's dangerous. I like his instincts around the net, uh, but he's not finishing. He's not making his shots at this point in time. And... This is where you're glad he's over there and playing games as opposed to waiting for NHL training camp. This is a, a good move by the Oilers to get him in there and, and uh, playing through this. Again, kudos to Ken Holland and the Oilers for getting so many players over in Europe, including now Dominic Cahoon. And so it's just, it is fantastic uh, that, that they've done this because these guys are going to come, they're, they're, they're going to be good to go from day one and they're going to be flying in, in the start of the season I think training camp is going to be fairly long for the NHL. I don't think we'll have a short training camp, but we'll see about that. All right. Um, William Lagasson uh, is uh, playing over. I saw one game, Bruce, and it's, mm -hmm. you know, the interesting thing is that we get to see these players in power play roles. Almost all these guys get power play time, but they, which they wouldn't even get necessarily yeah. in Bakersfield, let alone the NHL. And Lagasson uh, does a credible job on the power play. You know, mm -hmm. he, he, he's got a... He's on a very good power play unit for one thing. Like this is a really efficient power play unit that really moves the puck. Uh, I can't remember the team he's on. Do you remember the team he's on? Oh. Uh, oh, it's a, it's head. it's Hasta Biden. La Vista, baby. Hasta La Vista, baby is the team he's on. <laughs> and um, he Hasta La Vista, and he uh, is uh, anyway. He's it's William Logason. He's still nasty. He still hits people. He moves the puck well. He skates with the puck well, but he's also on the power play, and he's kind of like he's kind of like the Oscar Clefbaum of that power play, just efficiently moving the puck to to either half wall and getting off the odd shot. So I, he he he's clearly at a lower level of play than the AHL, but he's he's doing very well at it, is what I would say. Yeah, he's a good wrist shot. That's the one thing that's different. Like like he's I mean he's. The only NHLer on his team, so I, I guess he was the obvious choice for power play. I mean, he's playing a couple of leagues down from where he was last year, so you'd expect him to be a fairly dominant player at his age. But uh, yes, uh, so I never thought about him get, getting a new role on the power play. But as soon as I saw him out there, I'm going, well, yeah, of course they're going to put him on the power play. And I mean, to his credit, he looked pretty good. I mean, you do like to have an offensive player or some offense in the player. And getting exposure on uh, uh, offensive situations. I mean, just like I like seeing developing players get the chance on the penalty kill, it's uh, it's uh, sometimes nice to see them get a, you know a chance in an attacking situation and, and develop their skills. And he uh, he looked quite comfortable in that role at that level, which is again, a hockey all Svensk in Swedish second division. So I mean, he should look good at that level. Yeah, it's that, the Oilers blue line depth is suddenly. Uh, gone from a nightmare, a freaking ongoing, enduring nightmare for about uh, ten seasons. You Come know, on, David. We've got we've got Ferrance, we've got Fane, we've got Nikitin. What more? From do the we time want? that Sheldon Surrey <laughs> got injured, you can date it from that. The, the moment he got was it in a fight. The moment Sheldon Surrey got injured in Grebishkov, whatever happened to him, and. And Ryan Whitney's foot's, you know, snapped, whatever happened there. And from those moments to, <laughs> till, you know, they had a nice, they, 
2016, 17, they put together a pretty good, it started then, you know, they, they got, they got, they started to get together, you know, with the Matt Benning signing. And then, you know, they started, it's the Secura signing and, and uh, Chris Russell signing. They started to, to get some players who could play in the NHL again. But right now, Bruce, the depth of this right. blue line, they're going to have to make some trades uh, because they got too many. Frankly, they have too many really good hockey players they can all a lot of them can play in the NHL. You don't agree with that? Well, I'm just saying, what are you going to trade for? More forwards? I got a lot of forwards too. Draft picks. Uh, I guess. Yeah. Well, I yeah, could use uh, trade, I could use some of those. But trade. Uh, uh, you know, if if someone, you know, they lost Matt Benning for nothing, mm-hmm. uh, but if they can trade um, one of these guys, and it maybe maybe it's Samarukov, maybe it's Lagasan, maybe it's um, someone else. You know, maybe it's even Evan Bouchard. I don't know. Like, y- you might want to trade someone for something that you really, really need because you have got excellent depth rate. Maybe it's Caleb Jones, you know, maybe. And and this summer, Brian Lawton, before Clefbaum got hurt, Brian Lawton was talking. He thought they were going to move two of their top 4D in mm-hmm. trades. I so I think they're thinking, they're thinking about this. They're thinking, okay, when is the right, when's the right deal to move a D-man? Because we got lots of really good ones, and they do, Bruce. They do have lots of really good ones. So there's trade potential from this, from this, thing, and they they're going to have to do it, or they'll, they'll lose them other ways. So, uh, and Lagasan Lagasan's on that list. Well, you talked about the defensemen uh, that started coming along in, in 2017. Well, the two, I mean, arguably, the, certainly, if you go by ice time stats, their their top two defensemen are guys they developed internally, both first round picks, of course. In Oscar Clefbaum and Darnell Nurse, yeah. and that's an area where they've really dropped the ball over the years. It's developing their own guys. They're always going out and signing, you know, Surrey, Visnowski, uh, Ference, Fain, all those other guys that they bring in from other teams because they've they've had a poor record of developing. Curtis Foster, defense. yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> done a, or Jim Sorry. Vandermeer. They've done a poor job of developing from within. So they got a couple of first rounders. But what's still always been missing, and I harp on this all the time, but, you know, getting those guys from the middle of the draft, from the second day of the draft, where the hell are those guys on the Oilers? And now you look at the at the, at the the system and you see William Lagason, you know, f- uh, fourth-round pick, Caleb Jones, fourth-round pick, Ethan Bear, fifth-round pick, Dmitry Smarkov, third-round pick. And, you know, and, and then now again in recent years, a couple more first-round picks where you have, uh, you know, um, uh, Bouchard and Broberry, who should be on a similar track to, you know, Clefbaum and Nurse in terms of the timing of them coming through the system. And so they're flush with internal uh, defense prospects, and that's what's really changed. It's been a long time since they had that. Yeah, so here's, let's just go down the list really quickly since we're, mm-hmm. just to refresh everybody's memory. Here, here's who uh, they have on the left side right now, Nurse, Jones, Chris Russell, Lagasan, Clefbaum, Lenstrom, Rollberry, Samarukov, and Nima Leinen. Mm-hmm. That's uh, one, five, nine, nine players. Nine players deep. One of them in doubt because of Clefbaum. Right. But eight, so eight players healthy right now. And uh, I'm thinking in terms of who could play in the NHL I, I, next year, uh, at least in a third pairing role, I would say I, I would be comfortable with. I mean, you don't want to rush Broberry, but he could play as third pairing NHLD next year, I believe, if you needed to, and he would hold his own. Wouldn't be the best path to take, but that could happen. I would say right. seven out of the eight could play. I, I'm not sold on Nima Linen. So seven out of the eight, that's pretty good. Uh, just on the, when you only need three or four, you, you have seven. And on the right side, they have Bear, Larson, Barry, Bouchard, Barryland. Uh, and so that's five guys and they have, I think Ryan Stanton, who's on an AHL contract, but they have five guys on the right side, um, who are, I think, I think Barry Lind could probably play as a third pairing D man in the NHL next year and be okay. Although I, I want to see more games before I really, uh, weigh in on that. So pretty good depth there, Bruce. Let's talk about the final guy that we haven't talked about in those demons, Samarukov, who mm-hmm. saw his game. What did you think? I did. Uh, I liked. I liked. I thought uh, uh, he looked strong. Um, 
he was paired up with a with a veteran smart uh, puck moving yeah. veteran Klaus Dahlbeck that was an NHLer for uh, for a while, and I think he's like 29 years old, and I think that's a real good pairing for from a developmental perspective perspective for uh, Samarukov, and I have to listen to the Russian pronunciation of that name a little bit more before I get it right. Anyway, I think he, you have uh, it right. I think I think he, we have that right. He uh, he um, play right defense on the left side right from the start of the game. Dahlbeck's on the left, uh, Smirkov on the right, and I thought, oh, let's take a good hard look at this. And right away, first shift, he made a, a stretch pass from the you know the the right corner where he's not on his well he was on his forehand but it wasn't against the boards but you know he he looked very comfortable uh, moving the puck from that position, and he's. Well, I guess he's not a guy I know real well. I didn't watch a ton of games when he was in junior. Uh, but he seems to have evolved a little bit into a sort of a more of a safe and secure uh, defensive zone uh, hall monitor. You know, like there wasn't a lot that went wrong while he and Dahlbeck were out there. And they moved the puck well. And, and uh, what couple of emergencies happened, uh, they responded well and kind of kind of made them go away and in this particular game he wasn't much involved in the offense at all but uh, uh, it seems like uh, CSKA when they get the puck over the you know it was their, their, it was their forwards that were driving the attack and their defensemen that were looking after their own end of things and they had the lead in the game which is sometimes you know the defensemen will get more or less involved in uh, attacking hockey depending on what the scoreboard is saying at the time and so this was a game where they didn't really need to push it from the back end, and they didn't. But what they did in their own end was was solid, and he was, uh, you know, nice and mobile and uh, good decisions moving the puck, and uh, you know, very little, very little going wrong uh, while they were out there. So I, I think he's playing a style that you have to see a guy play 20 games before you start to really appreciate it. But uh, I, I got. Uh, some pretty good vibes from this game. This is a player that's taken a giant step between a 20-year-old in Bakersfield and a 21-year-old in Moscow. And uh, maybe maybe it's just he's in his comfort zone a little bit more. But he's playing in the KHL. That's a lot higher league than the AHL. Yeah. He, so he 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 apparently he prefers to play on his offside. Uh, Fine. Uh, so uh, and yeah, it's that kind of metronome hockey, tick tock, tick tock, tock, passing it back and forth. The most common thing that I saw from Sam Rukov in the games that I saw, and we, we have an extremely similar take on him, uh, is that, you know, he's playing this keep it simple, stupid hockey. And it's he goes, tracks back for the puck, wins the puck, and then pivots really fast and fires it over to Dahlbeck. And Dahlbeck does the same, fires it over to Sam Rukov. Like they're just back and forth passing, get the puck out real simple, real fast. And, um, you know, he had the reputation for being a bit more erratic. In junior hockey, in this final year of junior hockey, he was this dynamic hockey player. Also. So I, I think he, you know, I don't think that's what they, they're looking for in Seska. I think they're probably under clear orders, move the puck, move the puck, move the puck, and he's doing it, and he's doing it really well. So so good for him, and uh, it, it is a, a, it's almost like watching a different hockey player, I think. And, but this this is a, in a but in a positive way, because I think building on this base, the dynamic, yeah. the he is fast. He's big. Mm-hmm. He's got a pretty good, decent shot now and then. He the, he's kind of a toolsy player too. So mm-hmm. to see this consistency in his game is a really positive development for Dimitri. He likes to step up and hit too, right at the right at the blue line. Yeah, he hammered this game where he just you know they were trying to break into the zone and it's, all of a sudden the gap that he was controlling was gone. He stepped forward, boom, shoulder right into the guy's chest. Puck went flying away to you know to nowhere, and uh, the rush was over before it really gained the blue line. And he's got that in his tool toolkit, and he's had that he's had for a while. Like he was, yeah. Uh, when he was in the OHL, I mean the the coaches in the OHL they had a poll in his last year. They called him the best defensive defenseman in the league. So yeah, that's, uh, that was I remember being surprised at the time, but I'm seeing it. Uh, or at least in this game that I saw, I thought, yeah, this is a nice sort of secure kind of game that he's playing. In. And uh, looking after the basics first, and uh, uh, like you say, it's a real good building block in his development. Even if he's eventually 
looking to become a more complete player. Well, the only way to be a complete player is if you can look after your own end of the of the rink as well as the other, and and that's uh, that's where he's made real progress. Yeah, and he'll be there all season long. Uh, the final player on our list today is Ryan McLeod Bruce. I don't. So I've seen his games. You haven't right. uh, in the okay, yeah. in the uh, Swiss League. Uh, I think he's playing for Zug, and uh, so I saw him score. Uh, Two goals in one game. We talked about that last podcast. This game, he he played 11 minutes. He won most of his face-offs. He didn't, he wasn't as involved in the game uh, this time. 11 minutes. Yeah, 11 minutes. He, 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 uh, he's, it's interesting. They seem to be drafting in terms of like, they're, they're going after the two types of players. In the draft, they're looking for big, fast guys with skill. Big fast guys. So they've in that category they've drafted Broberry and Holloway. They've drafted um, McLeod is another player in that category. Lavoie is not so fast, but he's big and skilled. So, and then it, when in this free agent signings they're looking for the you know the high like the super high IQ veteran player with some speed who can kind of fill in and uh, around the edges on the team. So McLeod. Um, He's in a good league for him. There's lots of wide open space to wheel and deal. He's he's doing very well um, in the in the opportunities that he gets. He had some good moments in this game, and I'm it's, again just really good that he's over there playing and showing a lot. He shows more on the attack in the Swiss league than he showed in the AHL, possibly because he's a year older, possibly because there's more this the, the European uh, rink, bigger rink style of play may, might suit his play a little bit more, but he looks good. I mean, he, he made a bad play on a goal against where he didn't cut off the cross scene pass and they scored. So I only gave I graded him a four, mainly because of that mistake and he wasn't on the ice for a whole lot, you know, only 11 minutes. But um, I, I'd given him a good, I think a seven in the previous game. So he's going to he's gonna have those up and down moments in games, but he's a good player over there. And uh, again, he's in the right place for him to to take off as a pro and um, he, he's, he's showing those signs. All right. Oh, yeah. Oh, so one ahead. other guy, the one other guy that we haven't talked about, he, he just played his first game, but we haven't had a chance to see it because it's not up available just yet is uh, Dominic Cahoon and very promising start for him with a goal and two assists and a three, two win in his, uh, in his debut to the 2021 uh, DEL Deutsch League season. You got to think so, the German league's inching up in quality too, towards towards the level of the Finnish league, maybe. Mm-hmm. Sure, uh, yeah. You know, better than all Svenskin at this point, probably. And oh, uh, yeah, I would think so. Yeah, the Germans are really coming on as a hockey hockey playing nation, and uh, Cahun is a big part of that. So I'm looking forward to watching that game, and Me again, too. I'll be reporting on it. Uh, Game grades tonight. I'll, I'll see Barry Lynn play again. And um, I've, we've already watched the Landstrom game, which we've talked about, and I'll report on that. So, well, Bruce, that's a wrap, I think. I think we've covered the covered the territory in our world hockey report. Yeah, a good thing that the hockey season is going on somewhere on the globe because it is uh, it is hockey season. It's nice to have games to actually go and watch real, live, competitive games. Yeah. And... To an Oilers fan, they may not be meaningful games, but there are meaningful players playing those games. If you, if you got to just like, I don't really care who wins these games. I just care how the guys look that we're that we're covering. And I saw out of five, I did four plus grades and and one mildly uh, minus. Uh, but um, fun fun to it to uh, see these guys in a different context and a great learning opportunity for for many or most of them. Bruce. Thanks for talking today. Thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.